Maybe it's a classic or maybe a flop Some of you have seen it and others have not So sit down and watch it, it'll make you feel glad Hey, have you seen this? Yes, Katie has seen that Hi, I'm Katie, and if I had a nickel for every time someone said to me, Wait, you haven't seen this movie? Oh my god, you need to see this movie. I'd be very rich. So this is my podcast, where I finally watch those movies you all have told me I need to see, and I tell you what I think. All right, all right, all right. Just like Matthew McConaughey likes to say, I'm doing something different for today's episode. You know how we've watched a lot of movies I haven't seen? Well, today, I'm going to be talking to you about five movies that I have seen that I love. So it's going to be a special episode, and I'm going to talk about five movies that I love and that I think you should watch. So this is kind of like a reverse on Katie hasn't seen that. This is a Katie has seen that and thinks you should see it too. So without further ado, I guess let's dive in. Also, happy 2021. Someone uh, told me recently that 2021 sounds kind of awful because if you look at it from the perspective of the year 2020 and then you add the one onto the end, it makes it seem like 2020 has one, W-O-N. But no, 2021 will be a good year. I foresee it even though I've had crippling back pain since the start of the year. But you know what? It's fine. It's fine. Can only We can only go up. We can only go up from here. And you know what? One of those things that'll make this year better is if you watch one of these five movies. This is important though. You have homework with this. If you watch one of these movies that I recommend, please tell me what you think. Give me your rating for this movie and tell me what you think. Did you like it? Did you hate it? Do we share similar tastes in movies? My hope is that if you like this episode, I can make more of these and intermingle them amongst me watching movies that you all recommend. And I can do like my top five indie movies, my top five comedies, my top five horror movies. <laughs> you know, just some basic things. So uh, listen to this episode and let me know what you think. Okay, so should we just dive in? These are in no particular order, by the way. These are just five movies I really like. And it's a freaking grab bag, okay? And I don't even care. I'm a freaking grab bag of a person. So these are five movies that have either influenced me or have become very special to me. And so we might as well just dive on in. I also want to point out, these are not like Oscar winning movies that were like, oh, these are the finest cream of the crop movies. These are just movies I freaking love. They're not going to be polished or regal in maybe the conventional sense. Like I, I, I don't have an affinity for Martin Scorsese or Quentin Tarantino. So they're not going to have that kind of polish that maybe some people might es- expect. Um, they have a polish to me though, and that's all that matters. So first things first, let's talk about movie number one, The Mummy from 1999. Say O'Connell, what do you think these babies will fetch back home? We hear you boys found yourselves a nice gooey mummy. <laughs> Well, congratulations. You know, if you dry that fell out, you might be able to sell him for firewood. (laughs) (laughs) This movie is a remake of the 1932 film of the same name. It was directed by Stephen Summers and it stars, oh, you know, just Brendan Fraser and Rachel Weisz and John Hanna, who I had a huge crush on John Hanna from this movie. He's the brother in this and he's fabulous, but also just this entire movie makes me so happy. Okay. This is one of the few films that I can watch over and over and over and over again. And it's like comforting and nostalgic, but I can't look away from the screen. I love ancient Egyptian history. I love anything to do with that. When I was a kid, we used to go to Borders and Borders had those like discount book sections. And I would just buy the discount books of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics or history. And I would just flip through them at night. And so when The Mummy came out, it was kind of the perfect movie for me. And I'll say it to you. I'll just lump this in there. The Mummy 2 is also a very good sequel, in my opinion. It's, uh, I think it wasn't that The Rock's like foray into acting. He plays the Scorpion King in that. Um, But back to the original 1999 film. Also, do not with that Mummy from recently with Tom Cruise. It's awful. I watched it because I love ancient Egypt. And they were trying to do this whole Universal Studios, I think, was trying to do what they did with the Marvel Cinematic Universe and make universal monsters into like 
it was something called the dark universe and they were trying to get like dr jekyll and mr hyde in it and like all these kind of stories we grew up with um classic literature the mummy i guess like classic like frankenstein like shit like that and try to get that into a series and i think the mummy just performed so poorly that they didn't continue doing any of that which i was okay with because i really didn't like it and it's really hard for me to not like mummy films okay this is this is these are movies i like okay Brendan Fraser's Mummy. It's so good, okay? Maybe it is something because I watched it as a kid. It's just got a special place in my heart. But I really feel like the story is interesting. The action is perfect. The, the romantic elements are good. The comedy is in there. It's just like the perfect quintessential 90s movie for me. And also it's on a topic that I absolutely love. This is hard to do without actually saying spoilers because these are movies I want people to watch. And if you haven't seen it, I'm not going to spoil it for you. But I really highly recommend this. It's about a librarian named Evie or Evelyn um, and an adventurer. And, you know, it, they may have or maybe not awoken uh, an ancient mummy that then tries to become powerful again. It's honestly a, a fun ride. If anything, don't go into this movie thinking you're going to be watching like some sort of theatrical masterpiece. Just go into it knowing that the CGI is going to be a little bit dated, but you're going to have a fun time while you're watching it. All right. So The Mummy is kind of required watching for me. If you have not seen The Mummy, please watch it. I'm going to give you all... I mean, okay, I was going to do ratings for all of these, but I feel like, you know, you know what? It. I'll do it. Okay, this one for me gets a 10 out of 10 Scarab Beetles. And if you don't know what that means, you will know after you watch this movie. Movie number two has a very special place in my heart, and it is Muppet Treasure Island from 1996. What? But I don't understand. What is the black spot? The black spot's a pirate's death sentence! Woo! Fabulous! They'll be coming to kill me! Tonight! We better help! Yeah, yeah, let's get some stress. My old sea chest and lovers are after! Underwear. But I'll trick them! I'll shake out another reef and daddle them again! Muppet Treasure Island, yes, it's a kid's movie. But I feel like people are sleeping on Muppet movies. And you want to know why? Muppet Christmas Carol, I've talked about that so much in the Christmas episodes has Michael Caine in it and has some of the best acting I have ever seen in a movie. It's the best telling of a Charles Dickens Christmas Carol. It's the only elite one. And so Muppet Treasure Island tells the story of Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. It is one of by far the best tellings of the story. If you love the Muppets, you will love this movie. Tim Curry is in this movie, okay? Tim Curry, the Tim Curry. I don't know how they get these amazing actors in these movies, but I am sure very grateful for it. And I honestly think my standards are so high for movies because the movies that I did enjoy as a kid kind of set the bar pretty high. It's got Tim Curry in a Muppet movie. We got Michael Caine in a, in a Muppet movie. It's clearly the creme de la creme. And I love the Muppets. The Muppets are very special to me. They are just something as a part of my childhood that made me feel safe and okay. And I love Gonzo. I know Gonzo gets a bad rap because he's got his weird thing with the birds, with the chickens. But Gonzo always made me feel like less of a weirdo because Gonzo didn't know who he was or where he came from. But it didn't make him any less important. And so I feel like even in, in my life now, the Muppets hold a very special place of belonging for me. And I feel like this movie has a lot going for it. It's got a great pacing it has music in it. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of musicals. I'll be the first to admit that. But I don't mind the musical numbers in this movie. I loved just going on this adventure of Muppet Treasure Island with the Muppets and the comedy they interweaved. Interweaved? Is that the way? Interwoven into it? And I think one thing people don't give the Muppets enough credit for is they have smart writing and the way that they present things that is entertaining to both kids and adults alike. I, I really, I give them props because I don't, I think that's really hard to do. This movie, I planned an entire birthday around. I wanted to do one thing on my birthday in 1996, and that was to go see Muppet Treasure Island. Picture this, little eight-year-old me being like, can I please go see Muppet Treasure Island for my birthday? And I did get to go see Muppet Treasure Island, and clearly it was a hit for me at age eight because at my age now, I still love this movie with my whole heart. And I think if you've never seen Muppet Treasure Island, you should. It's directed by Brian Henson, who is Jim Henson's son. And it's kind of pinnacle of Muppets for me. And yes, I know that this might be like, oh, it's a kid's movie, Katie. Why are you recommending a kid's movie? 
I just, I, I highly ask you to consider it. The music is composed by Hans Zimmer, as well as Harry Gregson Williams and Barry Mann, but also Hans Zimmer. And just, it encapsulates so much warmth. And I don't know if that's a weird thing to say, but this movie just feels warm to me. So I am going to give this movie a 10 out of 10 big blue wet things. Also, the movie opens with Billy Connolly, who I absolutely love as well. And I get to go on this adventure with some of my favorite characters of all time, which I was really excited when the Muppets were kind of making a comeback, like Jason Siegel was like getting them back. And I feel like I really wish that that is something that will continue on because I think the generation we have now, they need more Muppets. I, I, I'll i admit it, I need more Muppets in my life. And so please give this movie a watch and tell me that you love it as much as I do. The next movie, number three, we're going to talk about is Jaws, which might be a surprise for some of you because I do have a very irrational fear of sharks that is because of this movie. Slow ahead. I can go slow ahead. Come on down and chump some of this shit. This movie is from 1975. It was directed by Steven Spielberg. I know at times I can be a little bit hard on Spielberg, but this is one of the movies that I am actually like, he did a good job because I know there was a lot of problems filming this movie with Bruce the shark. That's what they named the animatronic shark in the movie that they used because they didn't use a real shark to eat people. I know, shocker. Um, but because of how the shark was designed, it kind of like froze up in the water a lot and it got it just didn't work properly. So I thought it was very well done that this movie does a lot of theater of the mind when it comes to the shark. And it was very effective because I I remember it was when I was a youngin, we had Thanksgiving dinner at my aunt and uncle's house and everybody was watching football. Little child me did not want to watch football. So they, my aunt and uncle said, you can go watch TV in our room. And TNT was doing a Jaws marathon on Thanksgiving. And I sat on a bed and I watched... Jaws 1, or Jaws, Jaws 2, and Jaws The Revenge, uh, no one checked on me. And now I have literally an irrational fear of sharks to the point where I can't swim in pools by myself. And there are occasions I'm in the bathtub and I'm like, a shark could come up the drain and eat me. I understand it's irrational. It's an irrational fear. But you might be saying, if this movie has scarred you so, why do you like it? Because it's so well done. It is one of the best horror movies I have ever seen. And because of that and how effective it was on destroying my relationship with water, I just think everybody needs to see this movie at least once. It's based on a book by Peter Benchley, and I'm somewhat curious about reading the book or doing the audio version of the book to see how it compares to the movie, uh, but I'm also afraid of that as well. It stars Roy Schneider, Richard Dreyfuss, and Robert Shaw is are in this. Is R? Is R? They're in this. And it's a horrifying horror film. Like, it's a really scary movie, in my opinion. And it does and did change my relationship with water. I think sharks are beautiful creatures. They need to be protected at all costs and taken care of. If you're part of my Twitch community, you are a space shark. Uh, I love sharks. I am so afraid of them, but I love sharks. Uh, when I saw this movie as a kid, right after I became obsessive and just started researching sharks and learning everything I could about them, they are misunderstood when we are in their water, when we are in the ocean, that is their turf, okay? We can walk around on the earth all we want on that solid, hard ground. But once you enter that ocean, that is their turf. And a lot of shark attacks happen because of mistaken identity. They think we're seals. We got shiny, glittery suits on on our paddle boards. And they're like, ooh, a seal. I'm going to go eat it. It looks like they have fish scales too. So it's, sharks are great, beautiful creatures. But this movie is f***ing terrifying. And my biggest fear is being attacked by a shark. And I have this idea that if if I'm in the ocean, I will be the one to be attacked. Like, I, I know it's pretty rare. It's going to be me, though. Like, if we're in a group and we're like, oh, we're going to take bets on who's getting attacked, I'm like 100% sure it will be me. So I totally respect the ocean. I will put my feet on the splashy bits that come up onto the sand, but I, I don't think I can swim in the ocean. Done it a couple times. I grew up uh, in New York near a beach, and I've been landlocked ever since, and I think it's safer this way. Unless a shark comes up a uh, Bull sharks can survive in freshwater for a bit. 
And I have never forgotten that fact. But if you're in the mood for a scary movie that makes me take my feet off the ground and cuddle them up close under myself um, in a blanket on the couch, Jaws is the movie for you. Watch it. You need to see this at least once in your life. I'm going to give this movie a 9 out of 10. You're going to need a bigger boats. No follow-up shark movies. Hold a candle to this one. And a lot of them are inspired by this or they pay homage to this. Just see Jaws at least once. At least once. I, I, You may regret it. You might be like me and like, I'm forever changed. Or you might just go, that was crazy. And by now, if you're listening to this episode, you've heard that I've inserted clips from each of these movies and I'm having such anxiety finding a clip for this movie. I have watched so many of the important scenes from this movie. And you know, that has something to do with some sharks. So I hope you know the sacrifices I have made to make this episode. Ah, okay. Please watch this. I had to watch a bunch of clips that have re-traumatized me. <laughs> Moving on to number four, it is Elizabeth Town from 2005. Bins are strangely delightful and very intuitive. Complex, almost too complex to be around. Do you know any bins? I know one Ben. Oh, I'm a student of names. <laughs> For example, what's your dad's name? Mitchell. Mitchell. Yep. Or Mitch. Mitchell is sometimes Mitch. Huh. Son of a Mitch. And today I was fired by a Phil. Phil? Phil's are dangerous. Phil's are less predictable than Ben's. This movie, I think not a lot of people have heard of. It has awful ratings. Now that I'm looking, it's got a 28% on Rotten Tomato. Okay, Metacritic with a 45%. I've been looking at these uh, throughout and I haven't been sharing them, but this one is abnormally low. Elizabeth Town is a Cameron Crowe film. I love Cameron Crowe. Cameron Crowe uh, has done a lot of movies, uh, a couple other of my favorites, but his most famous movie, I think called Almost Famous, Almost Famous. Uh, I actually don't like that one. <laughs> But I like this one. This one's Elizabeth Town. It caught me off guard when we first watched it. Um, and at that time, uh, Mark and I were dating. And my husband and I were dating at the time we watched this movie. And it caught me off guard. And I actually really, really like it. And I think I'm overdue for watching this one again. Um, but it is a romance drama movie. And it's about this guy named Drew who gets fired from his job. His girlfriend leaves him. And then he gets news that his father has passed away. So he has to go home and essentially the rest of the story is is a flight attendant played by Kirsten Dunst uh, helps him embrace life once again. And um, I really think this movie is underrated. I already said that, um, but I, I, I really do think that this one's worth a watch. It's a little bit long. It's about two hours and three minutes. I Someone told me they're like, anything, Katie, that's over an hour and a half for you is too long. I know. But sometimes if the movie's good, I'm OK with it. So this one's really good. I enjoyed it very thoroughly. There's a lot of there are a lot of fam familiar faces in this. Orlando Bloom is Drew, the main character. Obviously, Kirsten Dunst, Susan Sarandon, Jessica Biel. A lot of uh, Alec Baldwin's in the beginning of it. I I like movies of all kinds, but I feel like it's very rare that a drama speaks to me. I just feel like life is dramatic, anyways, and especially romantic dramas or romantic comedies. It takes a lot for me to get pulled in. And this one, I think, went deeper. I think maybe the people who watched this and gave it such horrible reviews didn't see the layers that had to be pulled away from it. Uh, so, I, yeah, if you're looking for, like, it's kind of heavy. I mean, the main character is a bit suicidal and uh, his father dies. He loses his job and his girlfriend all in a very short period of time. But I think the journey is well worth it. So if you haven't seen Elizabeth Town, I think that you should see it. I'm really hitting the gamut. I have a kids kind of movie. I have an action movie. I have a horror movie. And now I have this romantic drama thrown in there. And we're not even done yet. Uh, <laughs> this movie, I am going to give an 8 out of 10. Finding Yourselves. Yeah, I like that. I'm going to go with that. So yeah, give Elizabeth Town a watch and let me know what you think. Let me know if you think it's worth that 28% on Rotten Tomatoes. Because I don't think it is. I think the internet can be unfair at times. And for the final fifth film, Pan's Labyrinth from 2006. In darkness, there can be light. In misery, there can be beauty. In death, there can be life. Labyrinth. All right.
right, I had to get a foreign film in here. <laughs> I really did run the gamut here on genres, but I love Pan's Labyrinth. I saw this in an indie movie theater in a small town in Montana. My friend dragged me to it, and uh, this movie is outstanding. It's literally one of the best movies I have ever seen. It is by Guillermo del Toro, who is an incredible director and has such insane visionary ideas for movies and so i absolutely love this movie it is foreign it is a spanish film so you i'm sure you can watch it dubbed i recommend watching it with subtitles if possible the story is not only it just traps you when you're watching it and you just can't look away it's very very sad there's a lot visually that is stunning in this movie for a short little synopsis um it takes place in 1944 and the Allies have invaded Nazi-held Europe. In Spain, a troop of soldiers are sent to remote forests to flush out the rebels. The interesting take on this movie is this force is led by Captain Videl, who is a murdering sadist. I'm reading this from the synopsis online just so I can get the, the high points to you all. And traveling with him is his new wife, Carmen, and her daughter from a previous marriage, who's named Ophelia, and she's 11 years old, and this movie follows Ophelia and how she witnesses her stepfather's brutality and then is drawn into Pan's Labyrinth, which is a magical world of mythical beings. It has horror elements. It has fantasy. It has war a lot in it. It's very graphic. This is like, I think all of these movies, too, kind of range from G rating to PG-13. And this one is R. And this one deserves to be an R rating. So... If you want to be transported to a mythical, beautiful world in a very dark environment, this movie is for you. It is something that encapsulates like daydreaming to me. I don't know. I've been a daydreamer my whole life. It's it's a way that I've, it's a coping mechanism that I have developed since I was younger. And so this kind of was a movie that encapsulated that and put it into a visual context that made me go, oh my God, it's not just me. And I really think that this one is something that should be at the top of your list to watch. If you've seen Pan's Labyrinth, let me know what you think. I love Guillermo del Toro. I think he does such incredible movies. And I mean, they're not all winners. I will say that. But this one specifically is fabulous. And I give this one 10 out of 10 twisted fairy tales. So there you have it. Those are five movies that I think you should watch. And if you've seen any of these movies, please let me know. Tweet at me on Twitter. You know what? Play Katie Play. Come say hi to me on Twitch at Katie Peters Plays. And if you liked this episode where I recommend some movies to you or even just talk about some of my favorite movies, let me know. Um, I would love to do more of these. I've got like, I, you know what? This is silly. I have a, I have DVDs still. Don't judge me. So I was going through my DVDs and I was like, oh my God, there's so many good movies in here that I love with my whole being or movies that I'm like, I enjoyed the hell out of this. And I think more people should watch it and nobody really talks about it. So if you're interested in that, or if you like this episode, I definitely could do more of them. And I could talk about my favorite comedies. I can talk about my favorite horror films that actually scared me and still do to this day. And my favorite indie films, all of that. I could, I could do more of these. So let me know if you like this episode. I thought it'd be kind of fun to bring in the new year with something a little bit different and yes keep those movie recommendations coming i have a channel in my discord that you can find by just searching katie peters plays and you can post which movies you want me to see and I'm, i have a massive list and i'm working through it but yeah keep those recommendations coming and the next episode i will be reviewing a movie but in the meantime have a happy and safe start to your 2021 and if you're listening to this in the future i just hope you're doing really good Let's hope the robot overlords have not taken over yet. And if you are a robot overlord listening to this, hey, I hope you're having a good day too. And I will catch you all in the next episode. If you want to hang out with me more, or if you just want to yell at me for my thoughts on a specific movie, I stream over on Twitch at www.twitch.tv slash katiepetersplays. Also, feel free to follow and chat with me on Twitter at playkatieplay and on Instagram at Katie Peters Plays. Music written and performed by Mark Can Do It. Katie Hasn't Seen That is a part of the Geek Generation Network. Until next time, keep your popcorn warm for me.